never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Hi guys, welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Another fantastic day for an interview. And I've got Brooke Seam with me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this interview because Brooke um, is a woman who is out there. She's a she's an author, fellow author, and she has put her heart out and, and given her all her insight and expertise on a topic that not many people actually talk about. And that is the withdrawal of psychiatric medications, of antidepressants, because whilst it is good to be on them, sometimes it can be bloody difficult to actually get off them. And therefore, whilst uh, everything has got a good side, and, and certainly many antidepressants can be very helpful in the right time for the right patient in the right setting, um, today we are talking actually about the darker side of it. So, Brooke, thank you very much for coming on to my show. Thanks for having me. No, absolutely. Um, Brooke, tell us a bit about the powerhouse that you really are, and yet you always have been. You know, you're a woman who is going out there and is who is who is leaving her mark, often enough with very sharp instruments. And no, she's not a surgeon. <laughs> is that true? I don't know. My life seems uh, pretty quiet, non-eventful. Oh, <laughs> you're right. You're right. What about your story as a chef? What about your story as a... Uh, there is something there. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I am a, I'm a professional chef by trade. I I don't know if you guys do you guys have chopped down in Australia? I know it. No, it's in New Zealand where I am. Uh, so oh, no, oh, no, New that's fine for you in Canada. It's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, in the, I'm in the US. <laughs> uh, no, exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, chopped is very much so. It is something that is being shown here. So it's a competition oh, okay. uh, for master chefs out there, and you have been competing, haven't you? Uh, yes, I competed on Chopped and I, I won and people, people tend to like that tidbit about my life. It's provided endless hours of dinner party conversation, <laughs> uh, probably more than anything else, even though that was only one day of my life. And uh, I have other things that I've done and that have been important to me. And I'm just, it's you true. know, but, but we just talk about chop. That's fine. That's no, 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 no. I just wanted to have a segue to actually share a little bit about the high-powered <laughs> environment. Because come on, I mean, being a chef, talk about high power. Talk about there being there right now. I want it here. I want it perfect. I'm gonna talk about 110 uh, yeah. personality uh, in a high in a, in a pressure cooker environment. Am I not wrong? Yeah. You you say high power, right? It's we do we do hold some weird power over people in some ways. I mean, it's actually an incredibly intimate thing to feed people, uh -huh. and to the amount of trust involved is actually astro astronomical. And I think people forget that that you know, I mean, it's, you, you could easily be poisoned in a restaurant if someone worked in your kitchen yeah. wanted you to be, and and you you aren't. Um, hopefully ever. And so there, there really is quite a lot of trust there. And, you know, <laughs> I, um, I don't work in restaurants anymore. I own a bakery in New York City for many years. Oh, beautiful. I have a I have a long history of athletics, and I have transitioned my work into working with professional athletes instead. So mm. I do, you know, everything from meal planning to actually meal prep to keeping, you know, major league baseball players, fueled and performing and Beautiful. it's you know it's the same thing it's very much an intimate relationship you know even more so in their case and yeah so i'll, I'll leave you with that <laughs> <laughs> no that's brilliant um and it is but it is you're quite right our relationship with food is so fucked up um it is so bizarre uh you know it, it's not for nothing that the standard american diet is abbreviated as sad, sad. Uh, yeah, exactly <laughs> so therefore i think we both are talking we are both uh, are preaching to the converted here um because we know <laughs> about the power of nutrition and the power of nutrition when it comes to our well-being or our our not so well-being for that matter mm -hmm. too now you have written this book but that book is not just you know hey one day you wake up and think oh, i could write a book what could i write about mm -hmm. oh why not that yeah there's always a story behind that so tell us your story what made oh. you what made you become so passionate about that topic 
my, my book is called may cause side effects the bright orange cover i remember i think i can't remember something something was picked up in either New Zealand or Australia. So it might be wrong about the book. I think when it came out, uh, it came out in 2022. It's about antidepressant withdrawal specifically. It's my experience. It's a pure memoir in that, in that vein. It's not a pop science book. It's not how to get off psychiatric drugs. I am not a doctor researcher. And I recognize that after I had gone through my own experience with withdrawal, that there really wasn't any reference for people. I mean, and I say that in a way that there was no reference that people could identify with, you Mm. know, we didn't even have the word antidepressant withdrawal really in the scientific literature until 2015 Mm. in in a serious way. Mm. And I was medicated when I was 15 years old. I it was Mm. 2001 and I stayed on those same drugs for the next 15 years because None of my doctors questioned it. None of the prescribers, the pharmacists, really no mm. one questioned it. And they eff- effectively said, well, you could just be on these for the rest of your life if you want. But nobody was asking about my quality of life. Nobody was asking about how these drugs were contributing to my issues. No one was questioning what issues they might have caused. Mm. Instead, I was told that they were safe, which was quite frankly, a load of bullshit. And then when I went to go get off of them, because I had an opportunity to travel around the world for a year and I literally could not take them with me, Mm. it was presented in a way that it would be, you know, I might have the flu for a few days. That's how it might feel. And then, then that would be it. Then you would just magically have discovered this baseline, despite the fact that (laughs) I had been literally drugged (laughs) on six different drugs since I was a child. Right. But you're just going to be fine. And it was, there was I'm still shocked at the lack of at the lack of education amongst the people who have been entrusted with the power to severely and markedly change people's lives. And there's a huge amount of resistance there that pisses me off. And that's why I wrote this book, because I was tired of being told that what I experienced was rare or that it wasn't real. Or that it wasn't going to happen. And the truth Mm. is that it happens to people all the time. And it's extremely common. Mm. It's a wow. Wow. What a start of a story. Um, I think having said that, it's probably worthwhile that we go a little bit further back. Um, We've got here two issues. The first issue is no doctor will just willy nitty dish out drugs without actually thinking, shit, maybe there is a good reason to actually help a person. Yeah, no, that, that, stop, 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 stop. And I come to that. I come to that phase in a moment. Because we also know that, especially in the United States, there has been a, a, a craze of over medicating, of putting everyone on 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 uh, medications just because you can. Um, so there has been certainly a degree of over prescribing uh, and a lack of using more a holistic approach to whatever mind problem or soul problem there is so i absolutely accept both arguments uh 100 agreed with you um having said that what do you think happened with you uh what do you think was um do you think it was inappropriate that why did you seek the help of a doctor in, or in the first instance i think it was completely inappropriate my father had just died I was 15 years old and my father had suddenly passed away and I was taken to a child psychologist who, after a few sessions, called my mother and without giving her any context, because we have HIPAA laws here in the in the United States, I'm sure you have something similar there, but HIPAA laws here mean that you can't share private information with anybody else, right? You're protected. So even in the case of a minor, and it varies from state to state, but in the state that I was in, I was legally protected under HIPAA, so the psychologist did not have to share any information that was happening in the sessions with my mother unless there was somehow a threat to my safety or somebody else's. So wow. she she chose not to share any information with my mother, which also suggested that there was no threat to my safety or anybody else's. But what she did when she called my mother up was she said, 
I think what Brooks needs is a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. I'm diagnosing an anxiety and depressive disorder, and I'm recommending medication. Now, I was 15. My father had died within a few months of that. And so it was 2001. Prozac was the darling child of the world at that point. Exactly. Yep. You know, these drugs had just started to become approved for use in children and teens in the U.S. The only two drugs that were approved at the time for children and teens in the U.S. Mm. was Prozac and Zoloft. Mm. Interestingly, I ended up on Welbutrin and Effexor, two drugs that to this day are still not approved for use in (laughs) children or teens uh, in in the United States. So, you know, I, I I guess I'll let you put together whether or not you think that was appropriate. I mean, I you know, it's hard for me to blame anyone specifically in the sense that I think everyone was doing what they thought was the best thing, given the information that they had been given. And so I can, you know, I my mother and I have had plenty of conversations about this. Mm-hmm. I don't hold any ill will towards her, any resentment. I know she was just following the advice of a doctor because who doesn't mm-hmm. follow the advice mm-hmm. of their doctor, right? You know, perhaps a little bit of blame could be put on the doctor I went to go see, but, you know, it's not a psychiatrist's job anymore to actually give their patients therapy. It's their job to prescribe drugs. That's all they do. So what what else could you expect, right? So where I start to place blame is not the doctor who initially put me on these drugs, but the subsequent doctors who never questioned it, who if I went, you know, if I moved states because I, I lived in uh, Nevada, Vermont, and New York while mm. I was on these drugs. And I saw a couple different doctors in New York. Not a single one of them looked at my cocktail of six prescription drugs at the age of 22 and said, why are you on these? Mm. How long? Why have you been on them for six years? Maybe we should consider coming off of them. Mm. There was never, ever a conversation. Mm. May I please ask about, about where these drugs? Because you were saying buprenorphine, uh, Vexor. Is Venlafaxine. Yeah. Venlafaxine. Yeah. So those were the two psychiatric drugs I was put on. And yeah. then I had a whole bunch of physical symptoms that appeared within a year of being on those drugs. So at the time, we thought they were separate issues. What I'm pretty sure of now, I can't ever be 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that all of those physical symptoms were side effects of being on the psychiatric drugs. And the reason why why I say that is because when I got off the psychiatric drugs, all the other symptoms went away and I got off all of those drugs too. Hmm. So I was on uh, two separate doses of Synthroid for a hypothyroidism. I was on three to four grams, grams, not milligrams, grams of sucrophate, which is a drug for something called bile reflux disease, Hmm. which is basically when... It's like heartburn, but lower down in your mm. system. Mm. Um, and I was on birth control, which let's just put everyone on that when we're 15 and watch the fun happen. So on birth control, I was on isotretinin and I was on, um, what was that? It? I've lost count. Synthroid, synthroid. I was on two doses of Synthroid. Synthroid, mm. Synthroid, Sucrophate, isotretinin, birth control. Yeah, I think that was it. That and was then- so um, and then I would usually take like three to four Advils a day as well because of just persistent headaches. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Bloody hell. Where to start there? Where to start? Because you're obviously, you have gone through that. And when I sort of listen from a functional medicine perspective, then you see already the the things there occurring, how various organ systems um, are out of kilter. Your gut mm-hmm. was probably just as much out of kilter big time. Um, I don't even want to know what your gut microbiome was like. Um, no, but it is- I can tell you because I had it tested. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, let's go. Uh, do we want to go there now oh no oh no uh, yes come on tell us so when did you have to test it and, and what was the outcome so i got off all these drugs in 2016 i was in severe withdrawal for a year another year of less severe withdrawal yeah. after that so i consider it about a two-year long process before i started to come out of it yeah so now we're into 2018 mm. Um, starting in about 2018, when I was finally feeling like my system was fully stable, I 
was just, I mean, my digestion and my gut health issues were just an obvious mess. I mean, it mm. like you couldn't, I was sick all the time one way or another, or, and, um, so I was cutting out food groups, putting them back in. Then the pandemic hit, which complicated things just because, you know, I wasn't mm. really seeing doctors or anything at that point, but then in 2021, I just was so fed up and I was getting nowhere with uh, everything. And so I, I I saw some folks and I pretty much demanded some really in-depth testing. <laughs> and so one of the tests we did was a GI map and I had an active Giardia infection, ah. a staph infection, a strep infection, and H. pylori. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no shit, Sherlock. I could have told you that. Yeah, yeah. And... <laughs> The Giardia, like, fair enough, right? I mean, I had done an extensive traveling, and so I'm sure I picked that up while traveling from uh, bad water. But uh, the reality is I didn't have a gut microbiome or a uh, an immune system that had any capacity to fight this stuff off. Absolutely. absolutely. And on top of that, I can't, like, do gluten or dairy, which I didn't know, so I was just trying to eat plain foods all the time, just... <laughs> exacerbating the issue and exactly you had your leaky gut so it was all yeah. an absolute oh a mess um and that and... takes a long time to heal like sure, even yeah. i'm still dealing with it it's been seven sure. years sure 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 100 agreed absolutely i think the reality though is what you're describing is is so beautiful because now you have got the lens of hindsight you've got you've done the testing you've you've been guided by a functional medicine uh practitioner um and um you are now coming out the other end and that's so beautiful to hear but and so many other people though have got the same problems um so what you describe is probably happening to a lesser degree in the majority of the Americans, uh, just uh, oh, the, the, the symptoms. Yeah. Medicated yeah. on something. Yeah, that's right. Having said that, the, uh, when we come to the medications, um, I need to to say that really, there has been, or that there is the perception even amongst medical people, that there has been a very much an overprescribing in the United States with certain medications. Uh, no two ways around that. At the same token, um, depression can be a very life-threatening disease, and it affects about one in three people uh, in their lifetime. Now, there are a hell of a lot of things we can do about depression that have nothing to do with tablets. But at the same token, there is a, a small percentage of people there for whom medication might be truly, truly life-saving. Uh, and even more aggressive treatments such as electroconvulsive therapy, et cetera, can be truly, truly life-saving. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, but at the same token, uh, whatever tablet you take will not just have a desired effect. So for us, this kind of beautiful, oh, let's just take one tablet and then we're going to be all happy, my ass. First of all, not all of them will work. Many of them have side effects that often make it uh, imperative that you switch over. So I'm not surprised that you started on one or another drug and then you had to switch over until they found something where they thought things were working. So I think that's the thing that I need to throw out there. Um, there is um, not just everyone now think, oh my God, I'm an antidepressant, get off it. Um, if uh, it, there is always room for the question with your family physician and your GP. Hey, look, can we have a look at my medications again? And can we have a look? Do I really need all that? Um, so you are so right there. Um, so I give 100% that. Um, but I wanted to say that um, this is not a talk against all drugs. This is a talk about you have been on drugs. Why or how doesn't matter at this moment, you have been on them. And then you ended up knee deep in shit and thought, what the hell? No one can help me here. Is that fair to say if you put it like that? Mostly, I, I, I you know, um, the, the longer I spend in this space and the more people I talk to, the more frustrated I get with the blanket exclusion policy that everyone wants to put over it which is just like wait let me interrupt what you're saying in order to 
make sure we have this, this, you know, for some people, these drugs may be life-saving. It's just the, that's why we're here. We are in this place, at least in the United States, with this massive overprescription because of that mindset. Like, I understand what everyone is trying to say. And I understand that, at least in the U.S., people are trying not to get sued. And we have a standard of care here, which is medication forward. I see what you mean. Yeah. The problem is with that argument is that when when you are suffering deeply, and I say this because I suffered deeply for 15 years, I was absolutely suicidal. Like I was there. I get it. But that line of thinking is what keeps people sick because they think that they are not in control of their own lives and their own existence and their own perception of the world. And mm. so it doesn't matter whether or not you were to fall into the small percentage of people who could clinically benefit from these drugs because everyone, when they're suffering, believes they are the exception. And that is why we are in this situation. I don't really know how to reconcile that in a way that is fair and politically correct to everyone on Twitter. But the reality is, is that that line of thinking is keeping people sick and it didn't used to be the case. We've seen this and we've seen the rise of depression and mental illness and suicide go up with the more diseases that are put into the DSM and the more of these drugs are prescribed, which suggests to me that our strategy is not working very well. So I do not know where the line is between someone who could get a statistical clinical benefit in the short term and where somebody is who's really in a position where they need to understand how strong they truly are and they need to be pulled out of that by themselves. I don't know where that line is and I will never know what that line is. Mm. And I don't think anyone will know where that line is, but mm. we need to acknowledge that that line is really there and that we, mm. we like to massage it mm. in a way that makes people feel better about their choices but that's not what healing is and i think that you're on 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 the on the button there i think we are we are there's this this weird argument medication or not medication and that's that's a stupid argument in my in my brain because obviously you have got a problem and this problem is very likely to be multifactorial this problem is not just do we give a tablet or not? This problem is probably what was the trauma that you have gone through or that you're going right now through? And what can we do about that? What is the nutrition? What is your sleep? What is your hydration? What is your your what are the, the, the spiritual things that you do in order to sustain yourself? How do, do you create resilience? How, what is your emotional uh, awareness and, uh, and your emotional language? You, you know, there's so many things. And we think we can fix a life just with a tablet? I don't think so. And mm -hmm. equally, not everything that you perceive in your body is due to a side effect of a tablet or a co cocktail of tablets. Um, equally, if I just look at hyper uh, at a, lo a low functioning thyroid, there are a hell of a lot of uh, 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 symptoms that you mentioned that could sort of fit a little bit in that. Um, there are hormonal changes; they can cause certain symptoms. And to to now blame one thing. I always struggle with that um, unless you you have very clearly, hey, I take the tablet, I break out in a rash, I stop the tablet, yeah. the rash goes away. Okay, I can live with that. Or you yeah. you inject me with, with a strong painkiller, I start vomiting, I'll take that, okay? Yeah. But ultimately to, to simplify a life and all these beautiful organ systems that are intermeshed like a big spider web and... <laughs> to 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 put everything onto into one camp into one drawer and try to push that drawer shut ah i i struggle with that um so therefore i think is that fair to say yeah i struggle i struggle with that too because it's very much our reduction reductionist strategy and what frustrates me even more about it is that it's not what's what we see in most of 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 medicine right so you know, for example, my my stepfather unfortunately had a stroke recently and he's doing okay now, but it's been a lot of doctor's appointments, you know, and it's been a couple little follow up minor surgeries. And if you're going in for a cardiac procedure, 
that doctor is going to scare the shit out of you with everything that could go wrong. <laughs> right? He, 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 that doctor is going to make sure that you know you could die on the table. You could have a bad reaction to the anesthesia. You could be paralyzed. You could never speak again. You could, you know, we could leave a sponge in you, right? I mean, they will tell you everything that could go wrong. So you are fully informed. So what's your point? Then make the decision about whether or not you want the <laughs> surgery, right? <laughs> it doesn't happen in psychiatry. <laughs> and it also doesn't happen in just the realm of antidepressants, right? Because the majority of doctors who are no. prescribing antidepressants in the United States are general practitioners. So they are literally giving it out like it's Advil. There's no conversation about this. And I think that... Mm. You know, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, at the end of the day, I have no vested interest in whether or not an adult chooses to take these drugs. Hmm. I have a different view on children hmm. and I and people who are minors. Um, my issues with it are that millions of people around the world are taking these drugs thinking that they're completely safe hmm. and not having any negative effects because they've not been properly informed. Hmm. And at the same time, in the event that they do want to get off of them, there's almost no education or strategy for people coming. Like the doctors don't know how to pull people off them. Mm. Why should the patient know? And then then we can have big problems. Mm. So if if we could actually just work on true informed consent in the realm of psychiatric drugs, then, you know, I like would well, do whatever you want. Just don't hurt anyone. Right. Like. That's, that's kind of my philosophy. I hundred percent agreed. Hundred <laughs> percent yeah. agreed. I, I hundred I think, support you there. I think we also have a lot of tools that we're not using that could help guide these. You know, a lot of a lot of scientific tools that we could use that we're not using quite well. Like, for example, you know, there's some debate about the genetic testing for psychiatric drugs, and I don't, you know, it, it shouldn't be the the single guideline that's used in order to determine whether a drug mm. is is a metabolic fit for mm. someone but it's kind of pretty important to know if you're a bad metabolic fit for one of these drugs right because then it can literally build up the toxic levels in your system mm. because your body can't process it and the next thing you know if you're having major violent thoughts or sudden personality shifts well, then maybe you're not having a psychiatric break maybe you're re you're, you're you're reacting to the drug you were given three weeks ago right like just to know that right it's mm -hmm. not going to say whether or not something will work uh even if it's in the green column or whatever but it's kind of one of those things where if you are going to be a poor metabolizer of these drugs it's very very important mm -hmm. to know that and we Oop. have these tools and we don't know no, uh, 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 yes 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 in the ideal world yes absolutely yes. um having said that everything costs money and we are we are most of us are living in in pretty broken states um or states not in in the states of the united states but in 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 societies where there's yeah, not as much money or, exactly yeah. exactly and first of all that, that's number one the, everything costs money um the the second thing to say is that what you're referring to are very recent breakthroughs um you're you're right there is some fantastic testing now available but that sets you back many hundreds of dollars uh at the moment it may be uh in, in the u.s they'll do it for free Nothing is for free, my dear. In Nothing the, in the, ever. In, in the U.S., they will do it for free. There's a company called GeneSight that does this. And as long as you just, you have to apply, you have to prove that you are financially in need. But if you yeah. can show that you are, you know, within, they have, they have various breaks. And yeah. even if, even if you don't meet any of those breaks, then it's about $300, which is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money, yeah. right? I mean, this is not... There's a there's a drug that just came out in the U.S. that's ten thousand dollars a pill oh, for please. a new Absolutely. depression, right? So like on the scale of whatever, and in my opinion, like look if 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 I have if I'm a doctor and I have a tool that could cost any my patient anywhere from zero to three hundred dollars, and that is without hmm. insurance ever getting involved, and it could tell me if they're going to have a life threatening reaction to one of the drugs I'm going to put them on. That's a risk I might want to encourage them to take. Mm. At the mm. very least, I'm going to have a conversation with them about it, right? Again, this isn't happening. That is a very good ethical 
dilemma and ethical discussion that you're raising there. And I actually don't have an easy answer there. Yeah. I, no easy uh, answers here. <laughs> yeah, but exactly, exactly right. Um, it is, there are increasingly tools around and tests around that can help us to do more individualized prescribing. Many of these things are really coming out uh, new developments, but unless you are actually really into this kind of nearly like a niche um, kind of, of knowledge, um, as a busy uh, general practitioner, family physician, you need to know everything about hormone replacements and cardiac drugs and respiratory problems, COVID treatments, hepatitis C, the newest uh, developments. Hell, you know. They do not have, they don't get the exposure to such things unless you are interested in functional medicine and constantly listen to podcasts and go on to courses. You don't know about those things. So I, we need to give, we need to to make a reality check here with everyone out there. You You're are right. right that, there, that there is a, there's obviously a bottleneck. Exactly. But... I think it's good that that people know that these things are out there. But um, you say well, that one test and three hundred dollars. I would argue um, a far more common, far more important test would be a GI map. Would be um, uh, a um, a uh, a Dutch test, a hormone test, a hormone screening yeah. test, things like that, to actually see what the hell is going on with you. Even even uh, blood tests, a normal blood panel, panel that if you haven't got a private insurance, it, you, it's not so easy to get that. There is costs involved with absolutely bloody everything. And we see that yeah. here as well. So it, it, for me to sort you out, you know, I would say that's two, three thousand dollars uh, by the mm -hmm. time we're finished. That's a hell of a lot of money. And yeah, so I, ah, yes, in an ideal world, shit, I would throw all that at you. And in no time would we make, would we change your world dramatically, dramatically, because that's what you're doing now. That's what you're doing with your, with your nutrition, with your athletes. You are changing their world. You're feeding them. You're getting them to the top, top thing. And we can do that with virtually everyone. So 100% agreed, just don't just dish out your your uh, your tablets and then <laughs> fire and forget. Here you take them and we see you in two years. And that doesn't work. 100% um, agreed. But where in reality we draw that line where we say everyone should have X or everyone should have Y, no one should ever have that. Ugh. Well, and in reality, you're going to lose a lot of people in this process. Like it's just going to happen i mean i'm under no illusions that i'm going to convince everyone in fact i'm probably going to convince very few people except <laughs> the exact ones who are listening to this and and it meets them right where they need to be but but i do think that you know what it really speaks to is how much agency the patient needs to have yep. i mean i i am I'm with you in the fact that, you know, I don't know anything about the New Zealand medical system, but the in the American medical system, it's getting, I think telehealth is making things worse. Because unless, unless it's like mm. my finger is the size of a sausage and it's like, ah, oh, cellulitis, here's, you know, I cut it, it's infected, here's an antibiotic. I can do that over telehealth, but like, you're never going to convince me that a 15 minute psychology appointment with someone I've never met who's sitting in their pajamas is, is, is like, Honestly, I think it's probably going to be detrimental long term, but um, sure. but the 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 patient, the person, you know, if you're if you're motivated enough to, and you're self aware enough to say something's not right in my body, mm. then then you need to realize at this point in the world, you also mm. need to have the self awareness and the motivation to do some research on your own take it to your doctor. If your doctor dismisses you and says something like, don't, con don't confuse my Google search or your Google search with my degree, mm -hmm. run far, far away and find another doctor because yep. that doctor yep. needs is, that's not a self-aware doctor, right? Because the reality is in our system, doctors are completely overwhelmed. They are absolutely driven by insurance companies, by pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies. It's the only way they get paid. And hospital situations, they're forced to use certain drugs because they're contracted. Like there's just, it's not this art in most cases. It's 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 a series of steps in order not to get sued. So if you're the patient, it's pretty mm -hmm. important to be aware of that. 
because yep. that's how you were able to look at it and say, well, that doesn't seem right. I mean, back to my poor stepfather, he's a diabetic and the hospital kept giving him cardiac friendly meals after his cardiac friendly, after his cardiac surgery, which is just full of low fat carbs. And it didn't matter. Like he wasn't in a cognitive position to say, Hey, I'm a diabetic. And even if he had like, they fixed it on the last day, he was there for four days. And so nobody bothered to look and, and say, Oh, this man's a diabetic. We need to get him a different meal. Right. Was that because they were lazy or is it because they were overwhelmed? I'm not going to ascribe malice in this situation. It's probably because they're overwhelmed and they're used to working in systems. And someone who's outside of the system is going to throw them off. So you have to be the one to speak up. And if you can't say, hey, I'm a diabetic, you really got to hope you got someone there to say, stop giving him Hmm. the insulin, you know, the the things that raises insulin, right? Like it's it's tricky. It's horrible, but it's the reality. And you're going to have a lot more control over your own life and feel a lot more in control if we just realize that this is what's happening and that you got to step up for yourself. And for that, I 100%, uh, 100% agree. And I think there is, um, uh, for a lot of people out there, they um, do not take control. They are just like a cork bobbing in the ocean. Um, that's as much as control they have over their life. Uh, I see it again and again as an anesthetist when I say, well, which medications are you on? Eh. Uh, I think I'd, uh, uh, one thing for the heart, I think. And, oh, yeah, some <laughs> cholesterol. That's a, as far. And that is the, exactly what you're describing. Uh, people yeah, to do not take ownership. They are yeah. just, you know, uh, all that health shit. That's uh, not my, my problem. Um, not realizing that there may be actually problems there, either due to the underlying diseases or due to the medications that are used in good faith um, to actually control a set of problems which might sometimes cause another set of problems you know many drugs have got liver side effects next yeah. thing you know is your your liver function tests are completely out of kilter and that's the right. powerhouse that from? well exactly so so you are actually very very right i 100 percent agree we need to be far more um far more pressing uh on on our patients on our families to actually say hey mum it's cool what you're on. What tracks are you on, actually? And yeah. and um, tell us a bit more about it. And you don't know. Well, let's look them up. Mm-hmm. And then, but, and so there is very much a stewardship and ownership there that we all need to take. We need to be take. We need to be owners. We need to be the ringmasters in the circus, not the bloody bearded lady. And unfortunately, that is the life describing the life of so many. So I actually congratulate you for going out there and speaking out about that, about taking the... Because I learned the hard way. (laughs) Well, exactly. You need to take control. I always recommend all my patients who are on, I have got a chronic problems to know more about that problem and about the disease than their doctor. Because it's their life. They are faced with the problems. Let it be diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure, whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. You need to know more than your doctor to actually really live your life to the fullest. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I think that that also fits for psychiatric medications. I loved, uh, in, in summary, I loved what you were saying about the uh, lack of informed consent. Uh, we see that again and again. The, the drug side effects uh, are not discussed. Um, it is, yeah, I, I previously, uh, run a large pain clinic. I had information leaflets for each and every drug that I recommended, including the side effects, including those things, but in plain, in plain layman's terms and putting, I think it's gotta be more than a leaflet. Like mm. I had leaflets too. Uh-huh. Leaflets are, you know, they're very, <sighs> you, you have, it needs to be conversations. You need to make yeah. sure people like actually, you know, hear it yeah. um, and, and internalize it. And some people are still are going to make the mental map. They're going to do the mental calculations and they're going to say, you know what? Like, yeah, I'm 22 years old. Maybe it's, maybe it's worth me completely numbing my genitals in order to, <laughs> you're laughing but it's called it's called psst it's called post-sexual ssri dysfunction Please, there's a huge I'm... amount of people whose entire like you know that part of their life has been completely ruined and they're 
they're they're devastated because they weren't told. And this is a perfect example. I'm bringing this up specifically because this is the difference between a 22 year old making that choice and a 10 year old making that choice. Right? Mm -hmm. 10 year olds not reading the leaflets. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't reading the leaflets at 22. I don't know if I would have made the same mental math calculations at 22 as I as the choice that was made for me when I was 15. But you have no. yeah, you have no reference that, point though. Um, exactly. Even even at age thirty two, if you have never had a problem with with sexual dysfunction, um, then you think, yeah. well, so who cares? You don't even know yeah. what that word even means. So, yeah. I. Agree. But if you're sixteen and you're in front of and you're and you're a girl and you're in front of a fifty year old doctor, mm. you really think that sixteen year old's going to bring this up? Mm, you think a 50 year old doctor doctor is really going to be all that comfortable saying it to a 16 year old girl in this culture mm. Mm. probably not right like these i realize that these are incredibly tricky things but there, there's got to be a better way here to make sure people really truly understand both the risks and potential i'm not going to call it a reward but like what is the trade-off here because there's mm. no free passes in physiology if you're going to alter your physiology, there is going to be a consequence. Mm. If 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 that yep. consequence is that whatever you're going through is so horrific that you need to be numb for a while to get through it, that is a perfectly acceptable choice to make. But I really don't believe that choice should be made without a full conversation about what that can mean and a plan to get off of these drugs when the when the when the situation has passed. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I think that is a, a wonderful way of looking at it. Yes. No, it is. I 100% support you there. Um, these are all very true things. These are very hard discussions to have, uh, mm-hmm. especially in in uh, in systems or within systems where uh, things are already at, at at breaking point and where there is where there's more focus on reduction of costs and on pure survival of the medical stuff, um, mm-hmm. burnout left, right, and center. Exactly. So you're right, hundred percent right. And therefore, I think your your book, whilst it is uh, it is a challenge to just uh, doctors, um, I think it is really important that that doctors read it, that mm-hmm. doctors actually see that side of of uh, patient experience because. This is your experience. This is your truth. This is what you have gone through. Uh, yeah. If we like it or lump it, if we don't like it, it doesn't really matter. It's still your truth. Um, and I think so. It's at least uh, fair that uh, that your GP has uh, reads that. Just out of interest, did you send a copy of the book to the doctor's in your past <laughs> you know i thought about that um one of them died so okay no that's no, a bit didn't. difficult to send <laughs> yeah yeah that, that wouldn't have arrived that would have gotten returned uh <laughs> i also i don't the the records for all everything that happened in my younger life are long gone we don't have many mm-hmm. records from about i think like my anything pre high school or during high school is pretty much gone i might have a few from college but mm-hmm. i don't as far as I know, I don't have, I don't know who the doctor was. that has been asked a few times who mm. the doctors or who initially put me on these drugs. And mm. I can't remember and neither can anyone in my family. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're like, they're probably retired at this point. So mm. it's kind of, you know, a moot point. I don't need yeah. to go ruin yeah. anybody's day. I'd rather no. get into their residence now. No, I, you're so true. So true. I think that is really important. And if you think back, uh, this is not the first time that doctors did try to do the right thing and ended up really fucking lives up. Take the thalidomide. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, it was a drug that was given to pregnant women to help them sleep, mm-hmm. etc. Yeah. And then children had basically uh, no arms and, and yeah. things like that. Horrible, horrible. And yet uh, doctors did it because they, they thought they were doing something good. And there are so many other examples there in history. So yes, uh, it is... This, uh, in principle, don't do harm. Um, That is a principle that we should always keep in mind as doctors, but it can be bloody hard because what 
we think today is true in five years 50 percent of what we think as a fact today will be disproven in five years time and that's mm -hmm. uh, but then again there is there is an, a duty of us doctors to actually stay informed do our yeah. best in doing so and i and that is where the 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 targeted pharmacology comes in, and that is where more genetic testing or uh, methylation. This is where testing. reading a journal could come into play. Like it does not have to be that. <laughs> no, but difficult. with which journal, girl? Well, there must there must, ten, there must be ten thousand. There must be ten thousand journals coming out every week. Which one yeah, shall I there, read? <laughs> well, if you're a psychiatrist, I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because in psychiatry, <laughs> there keeps there are probably ten or at least five big international ones then 10 other ones and then there are the functional medicine ones where you get where you got something about the interaction of bacteria in your gut yeah, with yeah, that yeah. okay so okay. they never come right. to that i i have a solution then okay. okay i think that the answer is you is the general you as in doctors should spend 20 percent of your education time learning about whatever topic in your field makes you the most uncomfortable. Ooh, nice. Whatever, whatever you feel is deeply wrong or against your philosophy, 20% of your time should probably be spent in the research around that topic. Woo. <laughs> okay, now that's a cool one. That's a cool one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because you always should. Best case scenario, you just confirm your own bias. You're like, this is bullshit, right? But like also best case scenario, you say to yourself, oh, I should probably know this. It's a good thing this happened, right? You know, maybe the people who are being critical of this have a point. <laughs> oh, I love that. So I absolutely love that. You, I, oh, wow. I'm so pleased that I had you as a guest on my show. Because, <laughs> you, you know, you, you make me think. And I think that's <laughs> the important bit. It is important that we reevaluate um, our practice. It's so easy to go into a rut. Um, and as a rule of thumb, I... Uh, every day where I don't learn something is a sad day for me. So therefore, you challenging me today, that made actually really my day because uh, now I'm thinking, okay, what makes okay. me uncomfortable? Yeah, I was going to say, what, 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 what topic do you need to go spend you know, exactly. an hour looking at in your own life? I mean, it's a good rule for everyone, right? It's like when you go to the gym, yeah. if, 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 if you're bad at, you know, running, well, it might give you, it might be good for you to spend a little time like yeah. asking why you're bad at running and maybe fixing it, maybe trying it because probably what will happen is if, if you spend a little time with it and you really intentionally do it, you're going to at least have a little respect for it. You might still hate it, but you'll have respect for it and you'll know more about the people who love it. And that will make you a more interesting and compassionate person. I could not agree more. And if we now ex extrapolate that even to maybe a little bit religion and a little bit politics, yeah. maybe this divisiveness. Everyone's well a little bit right about something. <laughs> oh, I love it! I absolutely love it, Brooke. <laughs> I mean, here you are. You have you have you have you have got all this passion there, and that is at the moment you you being you. But uh, tell me, who will the the Brook be in a year's time? in two years time we all are transforming and you are such a passionate woman you're who will i be i thought you said who will oh. book me? no no where no where will you be what are your what are your plans will you go more onto speaking tours or who who do you want to be when you grow up <laughs> you know i people ask me this question sometimes and i never have a good answer i feel like part of it is because one i feel like the pandemic screwed with my sense of planning <laughs> I've, I've, I'm now just in a position where it's like, I can give you a loose idea of what's happening in the next three months. After that, I always feel like everything's just falling off a cliff and I don't know. And I feel like that was kind of an, like, like the code in my system changed after going through the COVID experience. And I think it's a great gift because the reality is that I can't predict the future any more than anybody else. So my expectations are a lot lower and so I'm far less disappointed. So I actually, I'm, I'm very glad for that. Um, and then also too, I think after, you know, having gone through what I've been through, I mean, antidepressant withdrawal was far worse than the depression ever was. And it, 
was such a psychologically and, and psychically difficult experience and physically difficult in so many ways that I that I feel like I can pretty much handle anything at this point. <laughs> and also that I'm just really happy to be here. So to say I have no goals sounds like I have no direction in life. But it, when I say I have no goals, I really just mean like I'm open. I, I'm, I just want to enjoy my life every day. And I'm curating an existence that ensures that I have that kind of regardless of what big things come up. So beautiful. Yeah, I, you know, I'm an artist. I like creating, but whether or not that's painting or writing or cooking, I don't know. That'll always be a part of my life in the next one to two to 40 years. Um, <laughs> I like being near nature and I like dogs. Like those are kind of the, and I, you know, I want to be around my close family for as long as we're, we're all, you know, mm. like living. So mm. other than that, I got nothing like <laughs> whatever i love speaking i'm happy to do that but if i never spoke again i'm not going to feel like oh my heart is reached ripped open and it's just because i just want to enjoy being here and there's there's so much to be get, get curious about i mean if i don't Beautiful. you know if i were to never speak again or if i were to never leave the country again i'm good i've seen a lot of things i've spoken on a lot of stages and something else there's something else in the world to delight me so mm. <laughs> it is wonderful deep non-attachment <laughs> in a way beautiful beautiful and but you're open you're open to whatever the universe will bring you and i think that is yeah that yeah is so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to speak if, if you want to fly me to new zealand in order to speak at some event <laughs> let's do it like I'm gonna, i'll go be frodo for a while but <laughs> you have to feed for it <laughs> i do actually because i sort of run in the hills <laughs> oh i see oh there you go yeah um, i use this running example as a real life example i used to hate it and then i yeah. said well you know how i can hate something a lot less is to love it so i'm gonna oh. force myself to love it until i do and now i do hmm. <laughs> well was it not not who said it one of your presidents many many moons ago uh said i don't like to i don't like this man i need to get to know him better um so, so it sounds like maybe roosevelt or something yeah like exactly it's one of those those dudes yeah. uh so yeah. having said that i think this is a beautiful summary and um, so thank you very much for for going out there and raising this awareness with regards to the side effects and withdrawals of anti psycho uh, antidepressant and all psychiatric medications yeah. but the same equally ap applies to certain heart medications um like for oh. example 10 percent of beta blocker patients their sexuality goes down the drain no one ever talks about that uh it's those kind of things uh, and there are so many uh, things that that maybe we need to speak up a little bit more about um and yes for you out there guys if you're on medications uh be open with your doctor be open and and question ask why and if he gives you a good explanation you said okay cool fair enough yeah. um if you don't take that you die well that typically is quite a nice nice thing um but there are there are maybe other times when uh it is time to review because times have changed things have changed you have changed and under such circumstances um status quo is rarely the right place uh to stay so Brooke, thank you very much. Uh, you're an amazing woman. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for coming on to my show. Thank you so much for having me. No trouble at all. And you guys out there, look after yourself and live with passion. Bye. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around.